Well, um, I hope you're happy. I um, hope you're happy with yourself, man. I mean, you're down in Orlando, and and it's. I'm sure you've heard from your wife or your kids. I mean, super cold, sideways snow, 30-degree winds. I hope you're happy with yourself, man. Are you ever coming home? Well, you know, it, it's. Uh, I appreciate you asking. I appreciate you checking in. My flight got delayed coming back <laughs> by a couple hours. I'm supposed to be back this evening, but uh, mm. looks like I will be spending at least a couple more hours in Florida. So, uh, oh, yeah, no. it's, it's tough, but, you know, some of us have to uh, take one for the team, I guess. Uh, ben Gessling uh, covers the Minnesota Vikings in expert fashion for the Star Tribune at startribune.com. At Ben Gessling uh, via Twitter or the X Machine to find... That cool Star Tribune story uh, on the process through which Kevin O'Connell and staff navigate when considering drafting a face of the franchise quarterback. Excellent, excellent read. What um, what resonates with you off what he shared, Ben? Well, I thought it was interesting, and, and I knew kind of their thought process on the pro days a little bit beforehand because everybody kind of got worked up last week about them not being at J.J. McCarthy's pro day, but – it was interesting to hear him kind of lay out the a, a large part of the process of how they go about it and and really the stuff about getting guys on film to talk through their own college offense and then talk through some Vikings concept and then going immediately out to the practice field and looking at that as a way to see how does this guy take coaching. I, I thought it was really interesting. He's trying basically to – see as close as he can what is it going to be like to work with this guy on uh, a Wednesday where it's, hey, we're working on, you know, red zone or third down or something, and we're teaching in the classroom and we have to go out and execute it right now. And if you don't do it the right way and I tell you, hey, I want you to take this drop differently or, or set your feet differently here or whatever it happens to be, how are you going to react to that? So a lot of this becomes – easier to do and easier to measure when they are in control of the process as opposed to the pro days where it's typically a script and they put the whole thing together and the, and the coaches don't really get a lot of input in how it all goes. I think that's a lot of why they've gone this way. And it was interesting to hear some of the ways that he goes about it and, and different things he tries to use to peel back the layers on a lot of these players. Uh, keeping Justin Jefferson in the loop um, was was not surprising, but and, and I'm being serious with this, and I know Justin, you know, is more accomplished than Jordan Addison, but, I mean, like, if I'm Jordan Addison and I read that, I, I'm low-key, I'm a little bit like, what about me? I mean, you know, I'd, li- I'd like to know what, what's happening, too, here, you know, because it does impact sure. me as in Jordan Addison. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's something to that. I mean, obviously, he's going to be a guy that is affected by this as as he goes through the rest of his rookie deal and then possibly if he signs an extension here going forward. I, I think it's possible he's doing that with Addison, too. It's just that Jefferson got asked about yesterday, so he, he laid out a little more, more of that. But I do think Jefferson is in a different spot, both because of what he's accomplished and – the fact that he is going to have, I think, a larger leadership role on this team next year than he has. I mean, he was a captain last year, and, and Kevin O'Connell's talked about that a couple of times. But I think he's going to have a larger voice in that locker room. If you think about the guys that they lost, whether it's uh, Daniil Hunter, who didn't have a loud voice, but obviously a guy that's been around a long time, certainly Kirk Cousins, Jordan Hicks. I mean, a lot of the veterans in that room – are gone, and Justin Jefferson now becomes one of the more accomplished players in that locker room, certainly from what he's accomplished on the field, but also just the number of years he's been around. He, You very quickly become one of the guys that has the most experience on the team, especially when they're going to be as young as they are. And I think that had a little bit to do with why he's working with him on this process as well. And just, you know, let's be honest, they're trying to get a contract done with him. He's a guy that you need to – keep in the loop and keep happy as you're trying to get all this done. Any um, uh, And on that, Ben, any chance they don't acquiesce to Jefferson's contractual demands, let him play out the 24 and franchise him in 25 for like $21 million? I mean, it's certainly a possibility. I know they have thought about that. I mean, I certainly just with the regard to it's an option. I mean, they can do it, and I suppose really could do it twice. I don't think anybody wants to do that. I don't think anybody feels like that would be good for 
Justin Jefferson wouldn't be good for the relationship with the team. I I don't think that's going to come to that point. I I think their approach has been you know, kind of what they've said. Let's make him the highest paid receiver in the league. They haven't really been shy about that. It's just trying to get the thing done is going to probably take a little bit more time. I would expect that happens more in the summertime if if it's going to happen this year. And I think it will. But uh, yeah, I mean they they certainly could use the franchise tag if they needed to do it, but. Players don't like them. It just doesn't tend to bode well for the long term. So I, I think if they can avoid having to uh, press that button in the case of emergency, they will try to do it however they can. Let's uh, let's take out the top three teams, all right, with the draft a month from Thursday. So just, just with your discernment and a right to change uh, the, the take if you get steam or whatever, cards, chargers, giants. Where's the sweet spot to find that fourth quarterback? Cards, Chargers, Giants. Well, I think the Cardinals have to be where you look first because if you're picking QB4, you are not the only team that is going to be in the market for that player. I mean, the Broncos, I think, are going to be exploring the possibility of a move up as well. You're going to have, I I suppose, the Raiders could. Um, There are going to be a few teams in that range that – would look at the possibility. So if if the top three guys are off the board and you like one of those enough to go up and get him, that would probably J.J. McCarthy in this scenario, I think you have to do everything you can to say nobody else can jump in front of us. We need to make sure that we are the next team picking the next quarterback and this isn't really up to anybody else but us. I I think if they can get to three, and I know this isn't the premise of your question, but I think if they can get to three, that is certainly a lot better. It gives them a lot better chance to yeah. get probably Drake May. But, yeah, I think you have to move up as high as you can in that scenario because there's already a lot of it that they don't control. As Kevin O'Connell said, you need another team to be complicit in your plan to move up. You need to have somebody else that agrees to the trade. and. I think uh, they would try to eliminate as much of that guesswork as they can. All right, last one, 90 seconds. I'm saving a fair amount for next Tuesday when we see you, if uh, if indeed we see you. And um, great work sharing all these new Vikings deals and what they look like. You, you can also see that at Ben Gessling uh, via his Twitter feed. And it seems corner Shaq Griffin and the $4.5 million package with a guaranteed base means he's a cinch to be on the team, right? Yeah, he is, and it was interesting even today, and I just finished writing about this, Kevin O'Connell talked about we want to play more man coverage next year. So this scheme that we saw with Brian Flores last year, and I kind of wondered this, how much of that was this is the best solution for the 2023 Vikings, and it maybe isn't going to be the thing that we hang our hat on in the sense of the zone coverage behind all the pressures forever. It certainly sounds like they want to play more man, and and part of why they went after Shaq Griffin is – He's a physical enough corner with enough length and size to do that. I, you know, we'll see how effective he is in that regard. But I think he starts. I think. I mean, Kevin O'Connell said it today. They want Byron Murphy playing more in the nickel, where they feel like he's probably best suited to be. And then, mm. you know, whether it's Evans or Blackman on the other side, you figure that out, or maybe it's even somebody you bring in later. But I think Griffin, both for the man coverage, for the the the, the ability to press a little bit, and then the freedom to move Murphy is certainly going to be a big part of it, and the contract would tell you as much because they aren't paying a guy that much if they're not planning for him to be a big part of the lineup. And I think a lot of what they want to do is going to look different defensively. And, uh, you know, we're going to see probably three corners more often, maybe a little bit less time for Harrison Smith to take some of those snaps off of him off some of that wear and tear. And uh, as part of that, you need guys you can count on, guys that have done it. I think that's what they're hoping Shaq Griffin's going to be. Safe travels, my brother, and I'll see you soon, all right? All right, sounds good. Ben Gessling, Star Tribune, StarTribune.com. Kevin O'Connell, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, joined 9 to noon, an hour and change ago, and um, offered thoughts on quarterbacks Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and J.J. McCarthy. Hear all of that uh, when we replay it next. Welcome back, 9 to Noon, and Kevin O'Connell, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. He's down in Florida as part of the NFL owners' meetings. He joined PA near the beginning of the show today, and you can hear the entire interview. It was a long one, nearly 27 minutes of chatter between the Vox and the head coach, but we're going to kick off a large portion of this where PA just kind of said things to start, like, 
What are the owners' meetings like? How are things going down in Florida? Uh, what's happening with everything at the NFL owners' meetings? Yeah, it's uh, it's a unique time of year for sure. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, most teams, if not everybody, have, has turned the page uh, fully invested in into the 2024 plan and beyond. Um, for agencies kind of come and gone, it's still going on in some phases. There's a lot of quality players still available looking, you know, looking to find their homes for 2024. But the uh, the draft process is, is full, full bore. And, and, you know, whether it's pro days, the combine's now completed. You've got a great initial feel for a lot of prospects. There's a lot of dialogue going on uh, amongst the teams, you know, formally, informally, you know, uh, here in uh, in Florida uh, about maybe what that draft is going to look like, who's picking where, you know, teams that potentially want to move up or down. Um, there's a lot of those things going on. So as the process continues to play out, more pro days uh, this week, uh, potentially some private workouts, visits. We'll have our 30 visits coming up here in a couple of weeks where they come to the Twin Cities to spend some time with us. And then, uh, you know, hopefully the picture starts to become as clear as, uh, you know, as clear as possible as we work towards the end of April. And a uh, pretty critical, exciting time for the Minnesota Vikings. I know that. Well, uh, KOC, uh, they went out and uh, got you a second first rounder for the draft. Uh, during a free agency period, 66% of your new players fancy the defensive side of the ball. So, I mean, it's a cinch now that you draft offense, 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 <laughs> offense, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we're still, um, I'm, I'm really excited about what we've been able to do defensively and for agency, you know, whether it's adding um, really impactful pieces like a Jonathan Grenard, Andrew Van Ginkle, Blake Cashman, um, just, to, just to name a few. We've solidified our depth a, a, along the interior of the defensive line with some some guys that will really play well as pieces around what Brian Flores is trying to do. Um, and then I think, you know, bringing back uh, Harrison Smith was a huge, huge thing for me. Um, you know, let's, let's just call it what it is, PA. Since we've arrived here in 2022, we've, you know, we've had some of our more impactful leaders move on um, to other opportunities and, and uh, getting Harrison uh, back in the fold once he decided you know, he was he was uh, giving it a go to play football. The best thing about it was he wanted to be a Minnesota Viking. He loves the fans of uh, uh, in the Twin Cities and Vikings fans all over the world. I mean, it means a lot to Harrison Smith to be a Minnesota Viking. Uh, and I know our fans feel uh, feel great about Harrison and, and the career he's had here and that it's going to get a chance to continue. Um, and I can't wait, quite honestly, till. Uh, we get to see him run out of the tunnel week one or whenever it is we get to open up U.S. Bank Stadium this year. Um, there's there's very few sounds like the sounds uh, of our fans when, when one of their favorites, Harrison Smith, comes running out of the tunnel. I look forward to that yes, once sir. again. Yes, sir. And uh, offensively, meanwhile, uh, a motivated, healthy Aaron Jones was added to the mix. I mean, holy cow, that's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, I just... You know, it's, it, there's 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 uh, there's few times, PA, when you know through free agency and especially uh, as early as as that happened. And uh, look, every team has to make decisions based upon what's best for their own salary cap situations. But uh, to to put it, uh, you know, very bluntly, I was running through the halls of PCO Performance Center when uh, I found out that that would be a possibility. Uh, I may or may not have reached out to Aaron and let him know that I would make the drive. Uh, to come help, <laughs> help pack his things uh, there in Green Bay and get him back to the Twin Cities as fast as possible. And I think the coolest thing about it is uh, there's really two aspects of it. When you talk to a Justin Jefferson or you talk to a Harrison Smith or you talk uh, to to some of the guys that have uh, been Vikings and competed against Aaron, uh, their excitement level of adding a player like him uh, who we have a lot of experience going against and know the impact that he has on the game uh, their excitement was obviously uh, pretty cool for me to see in my dialogue with those guys. Uh, but then also Aaron's excitement about joining uh, the Minnesota Vikings and, you know, from uh, his experiences playing at U.S. Bank Stadium to understanding uh, what it means, the passion of our fan base, um, knowing uh, what it's going to mean to be a part of it. And, and I think uh, that's why we we were so fast to wrap our arms around Aaron and, and let him know that, uh, we were really, really excited about adding him to our organization and uh, what he's going to do on and off the field for our team. And uh, I think he's going to be really, really impactful uh, for our offense, 
uh, when you start talking about a running back room that contains him and a guy like Ty Chandler, uh, among others, that uh, we feel really strongly about building around that room now. Hey, uh, hey Kevin, uh, with the draft 30 days away, is, is this a draft where there are quarterbacks, say, that will be taken Saturday? Uh, so, so third day of the draft, who have at least a decent chance of getting second contracts as starters, or is it not quite that deep? No, I, you know, I think, PA, it's just going to be a matter of uh, where those guys go off the board because there's no question, um, you know, the guys at the top of the draft, and, and rightly so, um, have a chance to have a, a big-time impact on whatever organization that's lucky enough to get those guys. But you're right. I think there's other names. I think there's other guys as you work through uh, the process here where uh, who knows where that player's ceiling might end up being. and. Um, you know, that's where does that does that player end up going uh, on day two? Like like you're saying, does that does that player uh, kill the process and end up uh, you know with a lot more teams being fans of those guys that they end up sneaking into the the end of round one or you know kind of in that pick twenty to to thirty five type range? Uh, I think all of that is possible. Um, I do think it's a, a good class of quarterbacks this year and uh, something that we've really had our eye on. You know, I know here in Minnesota. Uh, long before this process started, just knowing the type of players that would be available at that position. And uh, I know for us, you know, having to pick 11 and pick 23 and the flexibility that's going to give us, but also think about it uh, from a standpoint if, um, and, you know, if, if we don't move up or we don't move back based upon where we plan on possibly selecting a quarterback, uh, I do think there's going to be a lot of offensive players coming off the board uh, in addition to those quarterbacks early on, there's some elite receivers. There's some pretty big time special offensive linemen, you know, tackles, uh, guys that will probably step right in and start playing. Uh, you could be looking at that first defensive player going off the board, PA, right around our pick at 11, maybe right before, and what that looks like of, of possibly uh, taking a player that, you know, would be a top three to four pick and maybe last year's draft and now they're possibly available to add to your defensive front or your back end, whatever it is. Um, it's exciting. So we've got to, we've got to take all of that information um, into account and ultimately know that, you know, we're going to be aggressive. Uh, but at the same time now with those two uh, picks that we have, we feel they're very valuable picks uh, in the same draft in a deep draft. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, an exciting time. All compliments to Quasey. Uh, for going out and making that move early on in the process. So now we can really plan accordingly, you know, both in our attempts to possibly move, uh, but at the same time have the chance to add two really, really impactful players, uh, regardless of the position in a deep draft like this year's. And and KOC, everybody's talking about all these players, and, and, and a lot of the same names come up after that trade with Houston. And, you know, man, uh, I've been dying for a couple of weeks to ask you about one. What uh, What do you think about... Stanford kicker Joshua Cardi. I mean, it looks from afar like the kicker job might be up for a battle, right? <laughs> you know what? I, your excitement about that, uh, <laughs> you know, it's equally felt by me, PA. It really is. Um, I will tell you this much. We're excited about adding a guy like Romo, uh, you know, to the to the equation who we added. This guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've done we've done some deep, a deep dive and, and was able to get a get our eyes on him at kind of a kicking showcase that took place. And he was lights out there. Um, a lot of times kickers in their, in their journey around the NFL, you look at some of the, the best kickers in our league right now. Yeah. You've got the Justin Tuckers, of the world who have been elite from day one, but you've got some other guys who have took some pretty unique paths to trying to find a home. And once they're able to do that, you know, they take off from there, albeit maybe another league, uh, like the Dallas Cowboys were able to do last year and get a guy in there that I don't think he missed a kick until the playoffs. Um, or, you know, maybe a guy uh, like a Matt Gay who we had in L.A. who had kind of bounced around and been in Tampa, and then he ends up being a kicker on our team uh, that helps us win a world championship and then signs a, a big deal with the Colts. So I think there's a lot of routes you can go. I do think that there's some talent in the draft, like you said, and, uh, you know, where those guys come off the board, potential additions, uh, from out, you know, from as the free agency process continues, uh, all that's on the table, um, you know, uh, for us. And, and, and uh, in addition to still keeping our, our tabs on Greg Joseph and, and the big kicks that he's made for us over the past couple of years, 
as well. Now, um, uh, just a few more here. Thanks, uh, Kevin O'Connell at the owners meetings in Orlando. And and with what well, you know, you, you hit on the quarterbacks a couple of minutes ago uh, with Jaden Daniels. Can can LSU's Jaden Daniels thrive in a pocket based offense or does he need to get out there like Jalen and, and kind of improvise? No, I, I think he absolutely can. I think he's proven that um, when you really dive into his tape, uh, that's one of the exciting things about a player like Jaden Daniels is, you know, that clearly uh, he's, he's a guy that when he does take off and a lot of times his best, most impactful plays running the football come uh, as an extension of passing plays where, um, you know, he's gone through a progression. He's exhausted one to two to three. Um, and then with really good technique and fundamentals, uh, ball security, uh, able to climb up and out of the pocket. Uh, and really w- when, when he takes off from that point, um, there's really no angle uh, that's safe for a defender because of the, uh, the speed that he has in the open field. Um, clearly, he's going to have to be smart about uh, when he has the football in his hands, um, not being the biggest, strongest guy in the world. Uh, he's going to have to be smart about it to, to maintain his ability to stay on the field. Uh, he knows that, you know, he's, he's proven that in his Heisman Trophy season that he's got the ability to do that. Um, you know, definitely an exciting, exciting prospect. And he goes, uh, whether you're talking about Jaden or some of these other guys uh, in the draft, I think those are the types of things. Each, each guy kind of has, uh, you know, maybe uh, different strengths and uh, things that they're going to hang their hat on, but all of them, uh, I do think uh, when you're talking about some of these guys at the top of the draft and uh, where that line is drawn, um, you know, we'll kind of keep that between uh, the folks inside the walls of our building and for uh, for right now. But uh, I can tell you, I'm very excited about not only Jaden, uh, but the potential of some, a lot of these guys uh, that will be in the mix to to maybe become uh, Minnesota Vikings. Uh, understood. And and what, if anything, did Josh McCown tell you about uh, Drake May from their days together at that Charlotte High School? Yeah, Josh and Drake have a uh, previous relationship uh, that's a really, really good one. Josh has known Drake for a long time. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when we when we talked to him at the Combine, you know, Drake was, uh, you know, Drake was more interested in talking about, uh, you know, a potential uh, you know, uh, a, a foul call that Josh McCown had on him when they were playing pickup basketball back in the day. So uh, the uh, immediate uh, uh, controversy uh, picked up right where they left off uh, in previous conversations about that as soon as he walked in the door. But we had a blast talking to Drake. I know Josh, uh, you know, feels really strongly about Drake. He feels strongly about, uh, you know, his relationship with him and maybe where Drake projects uh, as an NFL quarterback. It's been fun diving into this process i know myself uh having gotten to know some of these guys previously through their tape um from uh 2022 and then seeing what they were able to do building upon that in 23 and and where they may project uh but i think another cool factor one of the things i thought about um with bringing josh uh, you know to the twin cities i I think he's going to end up having a chance to be one of the better quarterback coaches in in the in the national football league not only because of uh, his playing career and and what he meant to so many quarterback rooms, but he's got such a unique perspective and, and, and how to relate to players and communicate with guys. Can't wait to see Josh get to work with our guys. But also, P.A., think about it. He just went through, um, you know, a process in, in Carolina last year of uh, potentially trading up and uh, acquiring a, a quarterback of the future type player and, and getting to bring that guy in the building. And uh, we're, we're now able to, ha- not having gone through it with Josh, but, we're able to lean on that experience, the things that worked really well, the things throughout the evaluation process, maybe he would have done differently. um, And we can then uh, apply that to our process uh, here in Minnesota. And uh, couldn't say enough to you this morning about uh, the the great start Josh is off to and uh, where, you know, the the, the big time part of the process he's going to play throughout the rest of the spring. I know um, I know. accuracy with a quarterback is, is first and foremost with you. I mean, you've said it a million times. It obviously matters a ton. But, Kevin, is it fair to say that you heap a lot on your quarterback? So, therefore, with accuracy, the 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 composure part and the ability to, to process quickly. I mean, like, those two are as important as accuracy almost, right, with a rookie? Yeah, I, and I think 
uh, a lot's been a lot's been said, you know, about our offense and what we put on the quarterback's plate and all those things. I think uh, in any uh, type of offense in the NFL, regardless of of what you're doing schematically, what try to, what what strengths of your quarterback or your other offensive players you're trying to really highlight. In the end, our job as coaches, PA, is to put together an offensive system that maximizes our chance to have success. And, and you've got to take into account what you're asking your quarterback to do. You've got to take into account what you're asking the other 10 guys in the huddle to do, how you get your guys to play fast, uh, play with confidence, be aggressive, uh, and be able to turn it loose on Sundays uh, is the ultimate goal. And uh, I think that's what coaching is all about. Is you're going to try to build a system, um, but in the end, uh, that system needs to have the flexibility and the you know and the ability to adapt uh, to what your group that year does really well and and, and what you can uh, ultimately uh, do best to move the football. Where it becomes difficult at times is when you've maybe built that offensive system uh, for particular players, and then those guys. Uh, on a week-to-week basis, maybe do not become available and you're having to, uh, you know, on the fly adjust. Uh, what we learned last year is, you know, we had some really great moments. Uh, once, uh, you know, obviously we overcame the significant loss of losing Kirk after winning against San Francisco and we beat, uh, you know, we're beating the Packers 24-10 at Lambeau Field and uh, we lose Kirk. And, and now we're uh, kind of in a mode where, we were trying to go uh, week to week from there, trying to do what was best, whether it was Jaron Hall uh, for about 12 plays. And then Josh Dobbs, after showing up five days before, is out there beating the Atlanta Falcons and then the New Orleans Saints. And, uh, and then before you know it, uh, we're in a place where Nick Mullins is thrown for 400 yards against opponents. We're trying to just reinvent ourselves as much as we could based upon where we were at in the season to try to win football games. And uh, ultimately we learned a lot as an organization. I know I learned a lot as a coach, uh, as a play caller, and I'm hoping a lot of those lessons learned will only help us as we move forward uh, into 2024 uh, with Sam Darnold and some of our other guys in the quarterback room and uh, potentially a young quarterback as well. But I'm always going to try to do what uh, we think is best as an offensive staff and myself uh, for our players, by our players, and ultimately put those guys in the best situation to have success. Last one here, my brother, and um, I greatly appreciate the time. What um, uh, what do you see in J.J. McCarthy when you break down all the plays? You know, I see a guy that, uh, you know, maybe he didn't have the type of volume uh, PA that some of the other guys in the draft had as throwers, and um, I think that's kind of been talked about a lot, but I don't know how valid that is just because some of the other volume of attempts that you see from other players in the draft. Uh, they might just be bubble screens and RPOs and just kind of spitting the ball out uh, as extensions of the run game. So really when you start talking about something beyond the stat sheet, beyond the box score, um, I think you can dive into the tape and see some things uh, that J.J. McCarthy did uh, that maybe some of the other guys in the draft didn't do. He did play under center. He did uh, play in a world where he was part of a, uh, a, a strong run game that, uh, they tried to marry the run in the past with play action and keepers. Um, and then I think when you turn on J.J.'s third down tape, uh, you see some pretty uh, some pretty high-level production. And what does that normally lead to? Winning football games. Uh, when you run the football and you have a quarterback that can execute at a high level on third down, you sustain drives, you have a chance to push the ball into the opponent's side of the field and eventually down into the red zone where you, you hope to come away with touchdowns and not field goals. Um, but J.J.'s got some really strong tape. He clearly has a makeup of a, of a guy that's won a national championship. He's, uh, I think he's lost, uh, I don't know what the exact number is, maybe three games since he was about 12 years old. Uh, so this guy's a winner. Um, and uh, there's, there's a, lot to, a lot to really continue to dive into on a prospect like J.J. Looking forward to spending some time with him over the next few days uh, and really getting to know him, but also importantly letting him get to know us and uh, what potentially, just like some of the other quarterbacks, uh, hopefully get a feel for is that uh, if my name gets called by the Minnesota Vikings, uh, that, that's a really positive thing for me based upon the play caller, the head coach, the offensive weapons, the offensive staff, uh, Brian Flores coaching the defense with some, uh, some really good players on that side of the ball, and, oh, by the way, the best fan base in the National Football League. So uh, we're not only trying to get to know them, we want these guys to get to know us and what it's going to be all about to become a Minnesota Viking because 
uh, we want everybody. Uh, if we're able to add a quarterback in this draft, and we want everybody in the draft room, we want everybody in our locker room, we want everybody watching at home to be standing and clapping, and that includes uh, hopefully the player that we're selecting. As Vikings head coach Kevin O'Connell with PA this morning, 9 to noon, live from the NFL owners' meetings in Florida. You'll be able to podcast that entire conversation. There was more to it, believe it or not, uh, later on today after the show. Final segment, putting a wrap on things around the corner. It's 9 to noon. I can't wait. And thank all of you very much for listening to 9 to noon today. Uh, we are at Akadak, back at it tomorrow from 9 until noon. Uh, the about the only uh, thing uh, pertinent from the uh, local sports scene, in my estimation, that uh, was missed during the course of nine to noon, and it just happened like forty five minutes ago. Uh, the um, it's it's National Football League related, and Greg Joseph, former Minnesota Vikings kicker, well, he signed with the Green Bay Packers. Oh my gosh! Aaron Jones for Greg Joseph. Oh my gosh! Oh, wow. I mean, look at all of the drama yeah. for the 2024 NFL season that is super thick right now. Like 11 and 23, what you going to do? Bob Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, quoted at the uh, owners meetings, I believe yesterday or early today, as saying the paraphrasing, yeah, for, for my Pats, getting the quarterback situation stabilized that's the A topic, but uh, then uh, a comma, Mr. Kraft added, but we realize there are going to be a lot of desperate teams. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, it's from the anti-Vike at 12, uh, the, the Vegas team at 13, I ain't ruling out the Giants at 6, you're moving up a little or sitting there and trying to do something. Uh, the, so you got that. All right, that's thick and it's meaty and it's rich and it's succulent. So then you fast forward to the Minnesota Vikings regular season. All right, well, there's already a London game. So you got a London game. And you have Kirko Chains coming back to U.S. Bank Stadium with the Falcons. Oh, oh my gosh. And now maybe two against Greg Joseph, kicker for the Green Bay Packers. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, this is unbelievable how, yeah. how how thick and meaty this whole thing's becoming. No, it's sweet because, I mean, not only did they pick the wrong Carlson when they got Anders <laughs> over there, that, you know, it, the thing, hey, best of luck to Greg. He provided great moments. I think one of his seasons here he had five walk-offs or five game-winning field goals. That's great. He missed a lot of extra points from 50-plus. It was dicey at times. So uh, best of luck to him over there. I think if, if we're talking about Aaron Jones and Greg Joseph and making that swap, I, I like how the Vikings fared. I'm still saying a PA, we have the capital advantage when it comes to moving up and getting a QB if it does become that rat race with the anti-Vike and or the Vegas Raiders. Because in the end, that 23, that move that Quasey made is indeed the trump card. But back to your 30, 30, uh, 30 for 30 bit earlier. What if we could keep 23? How all that works? I mean, it's only getting juicier as we get closer to draft day. And and when I brought up kicker in the, in the 25 minute Kevin O'Connell chat, I mean, it was as an aside, kind kind of a kind of a joke, you know, to set up some some different questions about quarterbacks. Yeah. And I asked about the stamp for kicker and and KOC. You know, be KOC likes to give long-winded answers every so often i didn't expect to get one on the kicker and romo uh the tiktok kicker i mean he had some nice things to say about tiktok guys so who knows what's next with the kicker i wish you would have referred to him as the, so what's up with the tiktok kicker what right. do you think is right. that how you found him right uh well i'm sure there will be much more on which to opine tomorrow and uh, we look forward to chatting with you uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm Paul Allen, and here comes Nordo with a wrap on the show. And the wraps 9 to noon are brought to you by Casey's. And I look outside with that snow, and I'm just thinking, if I go and get an elite Casey's pizza and eat lunch at home, it's going to be amazing. Go to Casey's today. Early in the show, we had KOC. Wondering what he thinks about all the rookie QBs. Vox gets him on the phone. You're like, ask him, ask him. Insert name here. He says, I'd be happy if we grabbed him. So it seems there's no conclusion. We'll keep on trudging through mock draft delusion from LA to New York and even Ontario we're covering all ground each and every scenario 
I'm tired though, hunting for inside steam Looking at the snow more sideways than the hockey team Lips tighter than seams on Sauce's jeans It's not his fault, it's glandular, it's in his jeans 30 for 30 in just a heartbeat 15 talkers worthy to repeat Shout out to delivery drivers in this snowy state Charges inflatable doll, well I'm sorry, it can't wait And to Daniel Carlson with a chance to kick the Vikings to the lead in overtime, 49-yard drive. Snap spot. Right-footed Carlson kick is up, and it is no good. Missed again. Podcast today's Paul Allen Show. Or listen back to previous show and interviews by going to the iHeartRadio app or KFAN.com.